Let's try to have fun making a video. It seems so difficult these days. I don't know why. I have new merch. I'm wearing one of my new designs right now. I have two new designs up on my website right now. I'm so excited to share with you guys these new products. Both of these designs are dedicated to my late angel, Miss Sophie. If you've been subscribed for a long time, you have seen Sophie trickle through my channel and in 2023 of January she passed away and I wanted to dedicate a design merch launch for her because she was an angel and she really kept my channel going when I was in some pretty dark times so I wanted to dedicate some designs for you guys like I just said this comes in a t-shirt and in a hoodie right now I'm wearing the extra large t-shirt if you guys want to know how it fits this is the extra large t-shirt and also the extra large hoodie the white t-shirt and hoodie come in the this design which is called I'm a star featuring Sophie once again writing her name into the pavement which is reminiscent of the Grauman's Chinese theater handprint ceremony where actors go and write their initials and do their handprint to commemorate being a star thank you to my whole team who helped me with this merch launch special thanks to Irvin and Andrew Irvin is the one who made these beautiful designs. I will have his Instagram in the description box down below. So give him a follow. He does amazing work and I'm just so happy to be able to have him make these designs and make my visions come to life because I would have the worst merch ever if it wasn't for Irvin. So go to my website, trinlevel.com to get your merch right now. The I'm a star design and Princess Sophie. I would love to see you guys wear it. And I would love it if you guys sent me pictures of you with your or cats or dogs or any animal for that matter with these designs because Sophie was mine Juno's now mine as well maybe we'll have a Juno launch in the future she was my comfort animal for a very long time my BFF and I would love to see you guys with your BFFs in my new merch today thank you guys so much for supporting me I would not be able to do any of this without your support I love you guys so much and I'm so happy that I'm able to do this Listen, I heard what you guys thought about the last video. I heard what you guys thought of part one. You hated it. You basically hated it. Okay, I get it. You guys did not like it that it was basically recaps. You guys don't like the recaps. You guys want commentaries back. I can't do a commentary for this video because I've already put so much time and dedication into writing this out. But one thing that I'm going to switch in this video is that I'm going to make it more of a in-depth review on each individual movie rather than making it sort of a recap of individual scenes and giving you my thoughts on individual scenes. So if you haven't watched the movies, please go watch the movies because otherwise you're not going to understand what's happening. So if I'm talking about a scene and you don't know the context of it and you're confused, that's a personal issue. You guys should go watch the movie. Come with me as I talk about some of my favorite movies ever. This includes X-Men First Class, X-Men Days of Future Past, and two questions of a movies x-men apocalypse and x-men dark phoenix first class is really revolutionary for many different reasons first of all the comic book that it's based off is actually like i i think they did a superb job picking which movie they wanted the prequel to be of x-men first class is an amazing story it is so vital and it showcases some really cool characters but the first scene that happens within x-men first class is a callback to the first scene in x-men the original movie x-men we already know that magneto was separated from his mother in a polish concentration camp and this is when he discovers his powers but in this movie, we finally get to see the extent of what actually happened in this scene and in this part of his life that kind of really is integral to the character that he is. Try. But the most important part of this movie is not just Magneto's origin story, but Charles and the fact that they are shown back to back because we see Charles's origin story. He lives in a mansion and we see how he finds Mystique. Mystique was pretending to be his mother, stealing from his house. And Charles takes her in and says that she never has to steal food ever again, that like we're going to be family, basically. The contrast between these scenes of Eric's origin story and Charles is so important if you were to watch these in the timeline of first class first because it's the first in the timeline that should spoil the fact that they could never 
ever want the same things. I really love where they take Mystique's character arc within this movie because it really does do a 180 on what we know Mystique to be, especially if you've only watched the original trilogy. When you see the original trilogy, she's ruthless, she's dedicated, she's loyal, she's, a, she's all Team Magneto. And within this first scene, we see her being taken in by Charles, that Charles is actually the one to take her in as a little girl and they grow up together. One thing that's really vital throughout her character arc within this movie is that she's deeply insecure about her mutation, that she cannot accept that her natural resting form is blue scales with red slicked back hair. She cannot accept that that is her natural form. We see her asking for a lot of male validation within this movie. I don't know what's gotten into you lately. You're awfully concerned with your looks when in the original trilogy and the mystique that a lot of people know of is kind of like this like femme fatale girl that can do whatever she wants, that doesn't need the approval of anyone, that does what she needs to do to get the job done. And it's really interesting to see her at this point where she is a young adult, a young woman, kind of suffering from a lot of the insecurities that all young women look like. Mutants and proud. Or is that only with pretty mutations or invisible ones like yours? But if you're a freak, you better hide. It's a really interesting point to put her character in that place because you would think that a shapeshifter would have practically no issues about the way they look because I can be anyone I want. I can look any any way I want to look. I can have any power I want. I can do basically whatever I want. I don't have to conform to the genders of anything. I can be everything. And still we're seeing her face such universal insecurities of a young woman. And I find that to be so interesting about Mystique's character throughout this film. This movie surrounds the main villain, which is Sebastian Shaw, which is Magneto's, like Magneto's hunting Sebastian Shaw to get revenge on him, to kill him because he's the one that killed his mother. He wants to get him. I also like love Kevin Bacon in this role. I think he ate down. Like, I don't think anyone else could have played Sebastian Shaw. Like Sebastian Shaw is one of my favorite X-Men villains. I think he is so cool. And what I find so fascinating about this character is that it is basically the first Magneto agenda to be pushed before Magneto takes over the agenda. The base idea of this movie is that Sebastian Shaw is trying to create World War III between the Russians and the United States of America. So I hear you block the proposal to position Jupiter missiles in Turkey. I expect you'll reconsider. They basically want to send missiles and start World War III so that the entire world is exposed to radiation and that mutants will survive the radiation and kill off all the humans. And Moira McTaggart goes to Charles Xavier to seek his help because he has this thesis that mutants are in their near future and she goes to him basically being like, what if they're already here? Fast forwarding a little bit to a Charles and Eric scene because you know I'm gonna be talking about all the Charles and Eric scenes and this scene where they finally meet each other for the very first time is so it's so romantic actually so basically eric goes up to he finally finds sebastian shaw and gets kicked off the boat by emma i don't i actually don't know what the fuck this was he literally got eaten up <laughs> he got eaten up by emma she literally turned and kicked him off the boat like it was no big issue also but can we talk about emma frost for a second because emma frost is top tier mutant, one of my top five mutants. I love Emma Frost so much. I think her abilities are so incredible. I think her diamond form is impeccable and so like amazing. I think she's like one of the part of my language, but Kunti's characters to ever exist in the Marvel universe. I think her abilities are amazing. She has, she can read people's minds. She can produce allusions to other people to make them think that they're watching them that they're not, which is shown later on in the movie. She has her diamond form. It is just like, she can turn some of her body into diamond form. It is just amazing. So Magneto gets eaten up by M. Frost and gets kicked off the boat and he attempts to take down their submarine. So they're on the yacht or boat or whatever and they go off into the submarine down below. Shaw and his whole crew, they go off to the submarine below 
and Magneto, first of all, before this, he destroys the boat by taking a long chain, like a, like a, like a chain for like the ocean, like not just like a chain, like, and he tears it through the entire boat, which is one of the coolest scenes I've ever seen. I think that in this movie, they really do a very good job at showcasing Magneto's powers and its abilities and kind of the growth through the movies, because we already see Magneto at his full potential in the X-Men trilogy. So it's really interesting to see him grow in his capabilities within this movie. And then after the the submarine detaches from the boat he attempts to lift the submarine he is trying to lift the submarine as it is escaping him charles sees this and begs people to get him out of the water he's like there's one of us out there there's one of us in the water we have to get him out he's going to die you're going to die out there you have to let it go you have to let go you have to let it go you gotta help me you gotta get someone in the water to help me let it go and then he jumps into the water, jumps into the water for this guy that he's never met. And he jumps into the water and he like hugs him. Like he doesn't hug him, but he like wraps his arms around him. He's like, I know what this means to you, but you're going to die. I know what this means to you, but you're going to die. You have to let go. You have to let go. Eric, calm your mind. Calm your mind. Like, that's Bafey right there. That's actually Bafey number one right there. Like, you thought that they were gonna have their first scene was gonna be like that, and I wasn't going to say that they should be together for the rest of their lives. You were gonna have their first scene be that intimate, and you were expecting me to not, ex like, not think that they're gonna, like, be married or at least have a couple of romantic scenes without the movies or something like that. Like, what are you talking about? Like, that is very romantic. You're not gonna learn. Eric, you're not alive. With Charles and Eric, it's one of the few ships within like traditional media where it's like predominantly straight characters within it that you really can't deny the amount of chemistry and intimate scenes that they have together that are just kind of undeniably romantic. That, like no one's making anything up. No one's like digging or reaching like that. They... They're in love. Another character that's introduced in this movie is Hank. And Hank's character is really, really annoying in this movie. I'm so sorry. He's like so fucking annoying. How wonderful. Another mutant already here. Why didn't you say? Say what? He suffers a similar fate of Mystique where he has this really big insecurity about his mutation. I love Beast when he's Beast. Like he's so servitude, he's so everything, Gagarella. Like I love Beast. Like I think he is one of the coolest mutants. I love his ability to outsmart his opponents when he's fighting. I think he has a really interesting fighting skill where he does have this brute strength, but he has so much intelligence that he's able to outsmart a lot of stronger opponents. But, Oh my God, was he so fucking annoying in this movie? My God, you would have, you like his hand feet, like he acted like it was so bad. Like it was hand feet. He acted like the world ended. I was like, people have webbed toes. People have webbed toes. I don't think people would really bat an eye if you had hand feet. I don't really think so. And do peep and in this world of mutants, do people think that people with webbed toes are mutants? Because like technically it is different. But is that considered a mutation? Do people think that they can swim really fast because they have webbed feet? Next is another Charles and Eric scene, which is Eric deciding that he like wants to leave. He's like, I'm gonna skedaddle because I don't wanna be involved with the government because fuck the government really and charles is like you cannot leave and he says this to him he goes it's not just me you're walking away from like what the fuck like these two have more chemistry than some full fledged romantic couples I've seen in romance movies. You don't understand how important they are to me. And then Eric comes back and is like, hey, if we're gonna go on a mission finding mutants, the CIA is not gonna be involved in that and it's only gonna be us. It's just gonna be me and Charles going on this mission to find other mutants being found by their own kind. And they do like the gayest mission together. Like I'm not even saying that to be exact. I'm not trying to exaggerate anything. They do the gayest mission ever. They freaking, they go up to mutants and the first, the first stop they go to is a strip club together. The first stop they go to is a strip club together. They go to a strip club together and they end up in a private room 
on a red velvet bed, sipping champagne like a couple. More tea, Vicar? Like a freaking couple, like having a little freaky night. And they go to find Angel, who like, sh he's, they're like, we'll show you yours if you show us ours. And they find Angel and she flies, of course, and they find a lot of other mutants within the scene. They find Banshee, they find Darwin, and they find uh, Alex Summers. They also have a Wolverine cameo where he says, go fuck yourself. Excuse me, I'm Eric Lentra. Tales Xavier. Go fuck yourself. Which is like so queen of him. Like, how cool would it have been to see him in the first class movie, like full on a part of the X-Men, but it's like not his time yet. Like, your time will come, queen. Like, pick your head up. Your crown is falling. So then when Charles and Eric and Moira leave for their mission, they end up, you know, attacking Emma Frost and getting information from her. But as the mutants at home are sitting there, like the recruits, they end up getting approached by none other than Sebastian Shaw and his crew. Shaw's whole crew attacks the CIA agents, they kill all of them, and they finally approach the mutants, all of our recruits and whatever. And he starts talking to them and he tells them that they can be like servants to humans and subpar to humans, or they can join him and be treated like kings and queens. And when he says queens, he looks at Angel and I just find this really ironic because he does treat Emma Frost like a servant. He treats all the people on his team like servants. Like you're not gonna be treated like kings and queens just because you're following another leader. Like the fuck? And then Angel goes with them, of course, because she wants to be treated like a queen. Like, okay, queen. We don't belong here. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. This guy just like killed a bunch of people and she's like, you're so fucking right, actually. Like, actually, you're so fucking right. And Raven's like, we need to do something, guys. And it's like, no, you don't. <laughs> like, no, you fucking don't. Like, you don't need to do anything, actually. Like, she just willingly went. Like, he didn't force any of you guys to come with him. And then to make matters even worse, Darwin goes up to save her. He shields Angel and beckons Alex to go now. Alex throws a ring of cosmic energy towards the one guy that can absorb it. Awesome! That's actually so awesome. This is like the biggest flaw of this movie where Shaw takes the energy that Alex just threw at him and goes up to Darwin and says, adapt to this. Adapt to this. As we know, Darwin is the mutant that can adapt to survive. He can grow gills if he's underwater. He can, you know, stand the temperatures of any environment. Like, he can adapt to survive. He doesn't have anything that he cannot adapt to survive to. That's his whole entire mutation. And then Shaw tells him to adapt this. And he takes the energy that Alex just threw and shoves it in Darwin's mouth. And then he literally goes through like seven phases of dying as if he, sh as if that changes the fact that he can adapt to anything. Just because he ingested it, that means he can't adapt, he can't adapt to it all of a sudden. Because if I'm not mistaken, he went up there willingly knowing that he could deflect Angel from Alex's cosmic energy that he was about to throw, right? Right. Like, he knew that, right? He knew that he was able, he had a shield ready. His whole back turned into a shield that could deflect from Alex's cosmic energy ring that he was throwing, right? So what the fuck changes about it that when Shaw takes that same energy that Alex just threw and put it in his mouth, suddenly he can't adapt to it because it's he's ingesting it? Like, the, the mutation only works if you are if it's coming to you externally. There are so many other mutants that you could have brought to have a sympathy kill within. So many other ones that you could have brought to kill, but you chose the one mutant that's entire ability is to basically be immortal. Sure. Sure, sure, whatever. Just do whatever you want at this point. Just do whatever you want. Mutations have no meaning. 
the the limits of mutations have no meanings these days and the the, the power described man means nothing the fight scene at the end of the movie is a fight scene you have classic mutant fights you know combats whatever they're fine i like them but there's not much to say about them if you've seen an x-men movie they're cool they're superpowers i love them one of the coolest scenes within this fight and in this battle is when Matthew raises that submarine from the ocean like that'll get me feeling some type of way that will motivate me like no other like I don't need motivational speeches. I need Magneto lifting the submarine out of the water played with that score. Why does that empower me so much? He, it, it's just such a well-crafted scene. I can't put into words how much I love it and I can't talk about X-Men First Class without bringing up how much I love that scene. I think it looks spectacular. I think it sounds spectacular. I have to give it to the theme and score of this movie. These theme and scores for this movie are there's two important scenes at the end of this movie and one is when Shaw dies and the other is when you know Eric and Charles have a fight and Charles is paralyzed. Magneto's talking to Shaw and he says everything you did to me made me stronger made me who I am, made me the weapon I am today. You are my creator. This is a very interesting point because of what we know Eric to be later on, him and Shaw actually have the exact same point of view on mutants and they believe that the humans will never accept them and that the only way for them to live in peace is to live without them. But he claims within the scene, he says within the scene that no matter how much he agreed with Shaw, Shaw still executed his mother in front of him and made him the monster he is today and made him resent who he is. And with Charles by his side, Shaw Showing him the extent of his powers that didn't lie within his pain and suffering and rage from seeing death and destruction happen, but within his serenity. That all along, he didn't have to go through losing his mother to reach his full potential. That even though Shaw created him and pushed him to his limits to discover his powers, there was another way the entire time. The side-by-side -side shots cutting between Charles and Shaw as the Cohen goes through Shaw's head is kind of magnificent like it is so excruciatingly painful to watch the agony that you see like charles showing is so hard to watch but i think that this is a brilliant way to show like, the extent of charles powers like i think a lot of the times we see charles do a lot of different things throughout the x-men movies in the universe but we've never truly seen him like truly feel what he's the the person that he's holding in place and I found this to be a really interesting way to showcase that and how that he was in a rock and a hard place that he could not let go of Shaw because Shaw would have continued the destru destruction but he had to live through the death of Shaw getting his brain literally sliced. Ah! The humans decide after they see that there's like a bunch of weird activity happening on the beach that they like should be firing at that instead instead of each other. Eric comes out with like dead Shaw and is like, I did just kill him, but like I high key agreed with him. Like, and I think that like I should be the new leader of you guys because like I didn't like him for personal reasons, but like Loki's message is actually fire. So like I'm going to take his place. And he's like, so stand up if you hate humans. Like, them bitches over there in the boats, they want to kill us. So clap if you think they should die. And like, as he's saying this, like the Russians and the United States fire their nuclear rockets at them. And Eric's like, okay, like. <laughs> and Charles is like, okay, like I have to like roll up my sleeves and take out my earrings cause I'm gonna fight this bitch. Eric, you said yourself, we're the better men. This is the time to prove it. I'm about to beat this bitch up. And he goes hand to hand with Eric in a fight because he knows that Eric won't kill him. And then Moira, like, I get it, but also like, I don't. Cause she decides to start shooting at Eric, the one man that can manipulate metal. I don't know what you were thinking. You should have like tried to whack him with a stick or something. Like out of all, out of everything you could have done, like, really? Obviously, Magneto deflects the bullet.
right into Charles' spine. Ouch. Ouch! That really does hurt. Ouch! It really is such a kick to the, like, chest to realize that the entire reason why Charles is paralyzed is because of Eric, his best friend. Like, if that's not a tragic love story, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. And Eric holds Charles in his lap as he pleads for him to join him in his fight against humans. And this is a really interesting quote. He goes, us turning on each other, it's what they want. I want you by my side. We're brothers, you and I. More like lovers. We want the same thing. Like, Eric is in love and he knows damn well that they don't want the same thing. Like, he knows damn well, like, they, they do not want the same thing. But he says this because he's so in denial and he's so in love with Charles that he does, he just wants to do anything to convince him, to join him and do what he wants. And Charles is like, no. No, my friend, we do not want the same thing. I love this ending. I love this movie. I think that like, it's such like a bittersweet love story tragedy between Charles and Eric. I love that the juxtaposition between their two characters throughout the movies in general, throughout the trilogy, throughout the new age movies, and you know, throughout this entire first class movie. I think that like the backstory and lore between Charles and Eric is so it runs so deep it's so vital to like the way they act later on and i find that this movie of exploring that relationship to be magnificent i find it to be one of the greatest things the x-men franchise could have ever done and i think that they chose the actors really well for this and like that's why they end up getting three more movies even though like after days of future past like you know apocalypse and phoenix or whatever like they get those because of the like superb work that james mcavoy and michael fassbender do as these roles i think that they are so I think they are so wonderful and I love this movie so much and I know a lot of people love this movie but I just I know I talked about it forever but it is just one of my favorite movies ever. A superhero movie it's my favorite movie. It's my fave. It's my fave. I love it so so much. Moving on to one of the most iconic films I've ever seen in my entire life. X-Men Days of Future Past. I want to start this off by saying I love this movie so much and that this review will be incredibly biased because I'm already predestined to love most X-Men movies, but mixing new age cast with old age cast, having that parallel line between the original trilogy and this trilogy is just like my personal fantasy. I love it so much. And I think that like this is where X-Men really does start building some repertoire because you have first class and days of future past and those two together make such amazing like actually such an amazing like continuation of the story and i think why this works so well is because the original x-men movies are kind of loosely based off a lot of different comics whereas first class and days of future past are based off of like one singular comic they do have elements from other comics i'm not gonna say that they didn't stray away from the source material because they definitely do but when talking about you know the last stand you're pulling in different comics that they're pulling from it doesn't really have a focused narrative whereas first class and days of future past definitely have a very strict focused narrative that they're following throughout the story and I think that's really integral and why these movies stand out compared to their counterparts. This movie starts off in New York City, the future, a dark, desolate world. Charles narrates the world that they now live in, mutants trapped and tracked, and all humans who help them are punished along with them. And the last line that Charles says within this narration is, is the future truly set? gagged at that point you should have already known this was about to be the most iconic movie ever because when he says that you know shit's about to go down if charles xavier is saying that you know shit's about to go down we see a lot of familiar faces within the first scenes of days of future past you see blink bishop sunspot warth path iceman colossal and kitty pride you also have ian mckellen and patrick stewart as their 
prize roles, Charles Xavier and Magneto. In this scene, we see them fighting, but not against humans or other mutants. They are fighting against sentinels, giant robots that have the ability to obtain any mutant ability, similarly to Rogue's power with the transformation ability like Mystique. More on that later. The whole point of this movie is that the sentinels only are created due to Raven killing the creator of the sentinels. Basically what happens is that she kills Dr. Trask, who makes these weapons and torments and experiments on mutants and because she kills him the government proceeds to go through with creating the sentinels and going through with his project because of mystique being in danger to them by killing dr trask and they use her dna to create the sentinels ability to transform to any mutation and so this whole movie centers around wolverine going back in time to the 70s and getting charles to convince Raven not to kill Dr. Trask and he also has to get the help of Magneto when Magneto is in the glass prison. What if someone can heal as fast as they ripped apart? And he has to get them to work together at a time where they couldn't be further apart. This is such a cool plotline to follow and it's so cool that Wolverine is the center of the story because everybody loved James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender as Charles and Magneto but they also have such a big love for Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart like they are just two there are just like this four people that are just able to do these characters so well and to have and to have the one person to connect them being Logan and being Wolverine that like is such a like even more beloved character than them is fantastic and I think that this story is just impeccable and I love the way that they are able to get to each point within the movie. Logan has this whole in-between moment where he has to convince Charles that he's from the future and that he has to help them because the whole world and mutants are at risk right now. And it's basically a lot of re-explanation of what we just saw happen within the first scene. So I'm not gonna bore you with that. They say that they need to find Raven. And at this point, Raven is no longer in the same position that we saw her in at the end of first class. So Raven is no longer with either of them. She's not with Charles and she's not with Eric. This always boggles me because as someone that didn't read the comics, I'm finding it hard to believe how they can explain that, okay, if Days of Future Past didn't happen, right? So Days of Future Past happens and it erases all the first movies, right? We're at the beginning before, before any of the time travel, time travel changes even happen. Raven is no longer with Magneto that we saw her in at the end of first class, but Raven is also with Magneto in X-Men X2 and X-Men The Last Stand. So if they parted ways before Days of Future Past and in between first class, they parted ways because Raven no longer agreed with what Eric was doing. How do they end up being back together side by side with Mystique so loyal to Magneto in X-Men X2 and X-Men The Last Stand? I always wondered that because I feel like it doesn't quite make sense how they end up being buddy buddy again because the whole reason why Raven doesn't agree with him is because she I don't remember. I think it's because she thinks that he assassinated the president. Also, by the way, this movie has a heavy lore drop where they're talking about how Eric is trapped in the glass prison and Logan's like, what the fuck did he do then? Like, how did he get in there? And then Hank and Charles is like, JFK. Okay. Like a heavy lore drop for the X-Men universe that Magneto assassinated JFK. Even heavier lore drop on that later when Magneto reveals that he was not trying to kill JFK, he was trying to save him. Because JFK was one of them. JFK was a mutant. What the fuck? And I looked this up and it like I looked up what mutation that JFK had and the only thing that came up that I could find correct me if I'm wrong and if there's more JFK mutant lore in the comics or in the cartoons but it says that JFK's mutation was that he had the power of persuasion so I guess he was really charming and persuasive okay 
Okay, JFK is a mutant. Um, Very cool lore drop, Magneto. Thank you for telling us that. You know, I have to talk about this scene. I have to talk about Quicksilver scenes. If you've watched any of my videos on X-Men, which I don't think many people have, but Quicksilver is one of my favorite mutants. I find his character to be so fun, lighthearted, and just a very... I think they reprised his role really well within this movie because I think a lot of people had preconceived notions of Quicksilver due to the MCU version of it, the comics, the cartoons, like Quicksilver has had many adaptations and I feel like they didn't really know where to go with Quicksilver. Quicksilver has a minor role in this movie, but minor doesn't mean that he's not vital. He's a very vital role in this movie because he is the one that helps them break out Magneto from the glass prison. And in turn, we get one of the most iconic scenes within movie history. We get showcasing Quicksilver's super speed powers. Oh my god. I could talk about this forever. And, you know, VFX artists, uh, if you know Corridor, I love Corridor. And when they went over this scene, I was literally gagged. I really just thought they were going to do the classic flash effect or the classic Quicksilver effect. No, just showing him go super fast slowing it down and showcasing everything that he's able to do within that time frame is just perfect. I love seeing this in this movie specifically because we heard earlier in the film that Charles had the school up and running but then he decided to close it down after a lot of the students and teachers got drafted to the Vietnam War and he was in a very depressive mode. You know, I also forgot to mention that he's walking within this movie. He's walking within this movie because, you know, he got tired of all the voices and whatever and Hank creates a serum that eliminates his powers but gives him his legs back. I don't know what the science is behind that. Okay, whatever. But I like adding Quicksilver because he is this like teenager at this time. And I think that that addition to the movie is really important. Um, being as the rest of the X-Men movies have this element of childlike wonder and optimism. No, you're not cops. Hey, what's with this gift to Youngster's place? That's an old cop. The first three movies take place at a school and first class being filled with young adults who showcase camaraderie and fun hanging out with others similar to each other. I think that Quicksilver's role within this, although important and integral to get Magneto out, we also get this very light, whimsical element from him that is really important to X-Men movies. I think that the whole point of seeing young mutants growing up is really important, and it is especially important for characters like Charles, because Charles goes back and makes the school, and I like to think that Quicksilver is somehow a part of it that like you know he is doing bad things he's stealing and stuff like that and guiding children to use their mutations for good instead of for bad i think that it's like a really interesting you know paths crossing for charles because he wants to teach young mutants a scene that happens right after this is eric and charles end up in a fight charles explaining he suppresses his power so he can sleep he screams at eric that he abandoned him and that he took raven and abandoned charles you abandoned me! You took her and you abandoned me! You abandoned me! You took her away and you abandoned me! And then Eric starts listing off names of mutants that we know from first class and he's like, Banshee, Angel, Hazazel, Emma, all dead or experimented on. Where were you, Charles? Where were you when your people needed you the most? Where were you when your own people needed you? And like, Eric says this as if majority of the people he just listed weren't people that went with him. Went with him when he said that he would protect them. I don't know about you, but like, I think only like one of the mutants that they mentioned was that, I think only one of the mutants they mentioned went with Charles. I think that was Banshee. Banshee was the only one that went with Charles other than Alex and Hank. Hank stays, Hank is there and Alex went to war. I don't know what the fuck Eric is talking about. He listed off all those people as if they were Charles' responsibility, as if they didn't willingly go with Eric when he said that he would protect them and push the agenda that Shaw was trying to. I don't know about you, but how is that my fault? Why, why, are, you why, are, you, why are you saying fuck me for when you were the one that was supposed to protect them? They left me, left me on the beach paralyzed. You left me on the beach paralyzed as well. And you're getting mad at me? That the people that went with you died. I 
just don't think that's fair. We've seen a little bit of Mystique in this movie, but Mystique is kind of in her full Mystique, you know, form at this point. They say that like, this is the day that the day that they're trying to get to her before is the day that she turned from Raven into only Mystique. And you truly see the extent of that within this movie. She is finally fighting. She is like tricking men. I love it when she tricks men and seduces them and then like kills them or something. I love it. I think that's everything. And I think that Jennifer Lawrence, I think a lot of people like rag on Jennifer Lawrence as Mystique, especially in referral to like Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix, but like Days of Future Past, she truly kills it as Mystique. And What's the matter, baby? You don't think I look pretty like this? <laughs> And I think that like in Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix, it really just goes to show that like the writers and Jennifer Lawrence really weren't able to come to a conclusive point on Mystique's character and where they wanted to take her. Like they couldn't figure out if they wanted to make her Mystique or if they wanted to keep her Raven. And I think that was a really big downfall of the character within the next movies. But this movie was so good. She was everything. I love seeing her character go through this turmoil of wanting to do the right thing, but also not wanting to do the right thing to want to save mutants and save them from being tortured. Whenever you got first class and you saw the two points of Raven's character, which is Raven in first class and then Raven in the original trilogy and trying to find out how she gets from that to there, it can't just be because of Magneto. Like it can't just be that Magneto was like that crazy that he just turned her into this. Like I like seeing her personality personal growth, especially on her own time, because throughout the movies that we've seen, First Class and the original trilogy before, you only see her at loyalty to either Charles or Magneto. This is the first movie that we see of her where she truly is on her own, making her own decisions. Eric, Charles, and Logan find Raven just before she kills Trask, and as, literally as Charles is like calming her down, being like, the gang's back together for you. Like me and Eric are together. Like we're here, we've come for you. Eric pulls a gun on her. <laughs> like what the fuck? Like, he's like, no, like you have to die. <laughs> like you actually have to die. If you're out there, there's no, there's no saving us. Like there will always be a way for the extinction of mutants if you're alive. And while this is all happening, Logos is having a PTSD trigger from William Stryker's face. Um, I would too, that bitch looks crazy. He has a trigger and he's like switching. He can't stay in his right mind within the future and the past. And he panics in the present day and he swipes his claw injuring Kitty. He like holds him down with his powers and goes restrain him. Bitch, you restrain him. Uh, restrain him. What are you talking about, restrain him? Magneto, what are you talking about? Your whole power is to man is to manipulate and control metal. And this entire time we're watching this motherfucker time travel, you didn't think to yourself, maybe it was your job to restrain him for a bit. And then you have the audacity to say to the other mutants, whose power, by the way, has nothing to do with that that they should restrain him. Girl, I, I'm i speechless. I have nothing to say to you because you're just acting like a goddamn fool. Like you're acting stupid. You're acting like you don't have a brain. You do it. You want it done so bad, you do it. This kind of pushes Charles to like get back in the damn wheelchair and start using his powers. Charles fails to work Cerebro and he states that he feels like a helpless student. And Logan tells him that the initial plan that they had was actually for Charles to go back in time, but he couldn't because he didn't have the ability to heal. And this is where we see James McAvoy and Patrick Stewart interact because Logan tells Charles to look into his mind, look past all of his pain and go into the future where Charles is. Because you have James McAvoy Charles speaking to Patrick Stewart's Charles and it's a very meta scene and I love it. I think it's great. I love the like meta-ness of it. I think it's like really cool and very interesting. You still believe? Just because someone stumbles, loses their way, it doesn't mean they're lost forever. And future Charles gives him a, like the pep talk of a lifetime. Like it's the greatest gift we have to bear their pain without breaking. 
they have a diva office of the century of who can play the better Charles and they both devour like showing off that they are both the perfect people to play these this character. They literally are perfect to play Charles. Like you can compare them to and compare their performances, but they are both perfect to play Charles. Like they eat every single time. They eat every single time. And as they all approach Washington, the X-Men of the future in China are finally coming into counter with the Sentinels that have finally caught up to them. This is a very big deal because, you know, they won't have time to time travel anymore because they're so focused on Wolverine and they can't stop him in the track. So if he doesn't fix it, that's it. This is a really cool scene because it's like one of the like only scenes we have in the X-Men movies of Magneto old Magneto fighting with the X-Men, with Storm, with, you know, with Bobby and stuff like that. There's also a deleted scene of Bobby and Rogue. I think they go, Magneto and Bobby go to save Rogue and, or they get Rogue from somewhere because they need her help and they end up rescuing Rogue and then Bobby dies. And it's also a weird deleted scene where like Rogue takes over for Kitty because she's injured, which I don't know how Rogue is able to do the same powers as Kitty, but like, I think that's why they cut it out for a reason because like, it doesn't really make sense. Like it does, but it doesn't really make sense. It's like has so much explaining to do to make it actually work. But I would have loved to see Rogue in the future. I think like that would have been really cool, but they deleted the scene. They deleted her out of the entire movie. I don't know why you would hire Anna Paquin and then just cut her out. And mind you, these deaths of the future X-Men fighting the Sentinels of the future is nasty. Like they jump scare kill Storm and it was evil. They all start dropping like flies in like the worst way possible. Like no mercy. The way these Sentinels kill is like, catastrophic they it is horrible deaths it's not just them dying it's horrible deaths it this is like this scene of them all dying in the future was literally giving breaking dawn part two like final battle scene every single character you love them they're dying you have you you saw them once dead you 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 wanted to see more from the characters dead they're all dying like literally no mercy. And one of my least things that Magneto does in this movie, and that's saying a lot because he's like a nasty bitch. He does a lot of nasty things throughout many different movies. He sees Wolverine approaching him in Washington, like in pastime, and decides to put metal rods and weave them through his entire body and fling him in the ocean. And then the bitch has the audacity to say, so much for being a survivor. So much for being a survivor. What the fuck is wrong with you? You are actually evil. That was actually so mean. <laughs> like, that was actually so mean. That was mean as fuck. Magneto was trying to kill everybody. He like wants to kill the president. He wants to kill the freaking Trask. He wants to kill Raven. He wants to kill them all. He lifts out the bunker and he's like, I'm gonna actually kill you all. I actually like programmed these sentinels behind me to attack humans, not mutants. So that fucking sucks. Mystique pretends to be the president and shoots Magneto. Charles talks to her before she decides to shoot Trask and lets her choose whether or not she's going to kill Trask or not. While she contemplates this decision, we see the final moments of the future X-Men and right as she makes her decision, the future group along with the Sentinels all disappear because she decides to not kill Trask, which is like the ultimate defying decision that she makes. And then we cut back to Logan present day or I guess somewhere in the middle between the past and the future and we see him with classic characters glimpses of bobby and rogue we see kitty and colossal hank in beast mode we have storm with her short haircut and gene as well as scott which i have questions being as what they do in the next movies but i digress and then the last scene of the movie really trips me up because i don't understand the point of it and i don't understand its actual relevance to wolverine's plot because it doesn't quite make any sense. Wolverine has a very intense lore and like the lore that they give him throughout every single one of his movies is just so, so deep and twisted and intertwined and a lot of it doesn't make any sense. But at the end of the movie, we see Wolverine get uh, picked up out of the ocean or out of the water that Magneto threw him in. And we see it's Stryker, okay? Like work, like Stryker obviously gets him because when Logan wakes up in the present day or like the time in between the future and the past, he has his metal claws. So at some point Stryker has to get him. So at the very last scene, Stryker gets him. 
but it's not Stryker. It's Mystique. The eyes like blink and it's Mystique's eyes. So what does that mean for Wolverine if Stryker isn't the one to actually capture him? Like if they were gonna do a different thing throughout the next couple movies, I might have understood it, but like, but I don't understand why they make it Mystique that's the one that's capturing him because he still has metal claws within the future. So Mystique's the one that makes his claws metal, but that goes against everything Mystique stands for. She doesn't like believe in torturing and experimenting on mutants. So like, what? That doesn't really make any sense. Like if someone could explain that to me, that'd be literally awesome because like, I've wondered that for a really long time. Like, of course, Stryker's the one to pick him up, but then it's not Stryker at all. So how does that make sense to how Wolverine gets back to his origin stories? And like everything that happens in X-Men, you know, and how does that get him back to, you know, the Wolverine movies, the Wolverine, yada, yada, yada. Like, I know Days of Future Past erase everything, but in this term, how is he going to get his metal claws? Because Mystique's not going to do it. Let's finally talk about Apocalypse. I, this is probably gonna be more of a rant about Apocalypse rather than an actual review of the movie. I'm gonna try to speed run this because I have less to say about Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix than I did about, you know, First Class and Days of Future Past, but I'm gonna try to give you a full, well-rounded review of both of them. Apocalypse is one of the silliest things they could have done for the third movie in the New Age movies. I think that it is really sad to see that they chose to do Apocalypse after Days of Future Past. I think that Days of Future Past has such a well setup for you to do anything you want really. Days of Future Past makes it so any timeline, any direction that you want to go to can be done because it erases everything basically. And they choose to do Apocalypse. The villain that is Apocalypse, the mutant that is Apocalypse is the biggest, baddest mutant there is really, like the known as the first mutant. I think that bringing out Apocalypse is really a horrible way to start this. I think that is way too much for them. I think they bit off way more than they could chew by choosing to do Apocalypse. Charles is running the school and we see mutants that we know of like Jean Grey and Scott Summers. Eric is in Poland working a factory job and living a quiet farm life with his wife and daughter. By the way, this movie touches on two of Magneto's 15 or so children. We have Quicksilver and we have Nina, but Magneto was rumored to have around like 15 children within the comics. And I think that their choice of using Quicksilver in this movie, I think that like it's like work, like, but like they do nothing with it. Like basically they introduce him and say that like, oh yeah, like I think Magneto's my dad. And like, it, it really is a pointless journey that they put him on for no reason. Like they don't end up doing anything with Quicksilver and Magneto anyway. So why even bring that up if you're not gonna do anything? So Apocalypse is this mutant that basically has every ability. He can do basically anything. He's like consciousness is transferred from different mutants that he's able to obtain their powers as well. And he's been like dormant for a while until these people who worshiped him brought him back. And now he's scouring for his four horsemen. His four horsemen in this movie will be Storm, Magneto, Angel, and Psylocke. He ends up recruiting Magneto after Magneto suffers a catastrophic loss. Once again, his daughter and wife are killed by one singular arrow after the policemen of Poland get distracted by Nina's powers and end up releasing the arrow. This guy can't catch a break. And Magneto's like, fuck it. Like, I guess I'm gonna go with this guy because what else am I gonna do? Like, I tried being at peace with the humans and then they killed my family. So yeah. Mystique is a real disappointment in this movie and in the movies after as well. I think that Mystique is a very dis big disappointment in this movie. And I think this goes for a lot of different reasons. I think like she has this super big like moment in Days of Future Past and it's so iconic and it reminds us of like Mystique in the cartoons and the comics. Like it's so legendary. And then 
in these movies it kind of like wipes her clean of like any character development that they could have been done is she's like stuck in this turmoil again of like not wanting to be the superhero that's looked up to and then she's in she's in Jennifer Lawrence form again and like this goes for a lot of different reasons like the writing is weird and Jennifer Lawrence also puts a new clause in her contract when she signs on to Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix basically saying that she didn't want to be blue for the majority of the movie due to how constrained it was and how long it took. This is a really big disappointment and all and also mind you these movies are also directed by Brian Singer who was actually a shit bag like actually like the worst person ever so like as much as I'm praising the movies don't be mistaken that I'm praising Brian Singer because I'm definitely not and Brian Singer is known to have a very toxic work set environment and specifically with women and Jennifer Lawrence has expressed her discomfort with Brian Singer on how his sets worked. The one thing I will say is that it's like a little bit of a disappointment that like she wasn't like in the blue makeup throughout this movie and I know that's like such a silly thing to say but like honestly like she just looks so weird throughout the movie because she didn't want to get painted blue. <laughs> Like she just looks really weird in the movie now because like you look back on Dark Phoenix and Apocalypse and Jennifer Lawrence looks absolutely so weird in these movies because she didn't want to get painted blue. It just looks like it is so off-putting to see the CGI blueness on her. There's a lot of stuff that happens in this movie and I'm not going to talk about it all. Basically the movie is Apocalypse using Charles as the new vessel for his body, wanting to use Charles's ability to connect to all the minds. He's like, you don't need Cerebro, I can be Cerebro. And he like wants to kill all the humans, I guess, and restart the world and start this whole new revolution, I guess, Apocalypse wants to do. It's very daunting, very dangerous, very scary. I think this movie does a lot of different tricks to try to get us to like it. I think that they throw in this Quicksilver scene to an iconic, you know, 80s song, and it's very cool, and it's very lighthearted, and it's very fun, and I do like that scene. I think that it is, you know, a fan favorite scene that a lot of people like and I think it turned out really well but I think this movie tries to do a lot of different like tricks to get us to like it and I don't think it actually ends up succeeding in the end. And to tie into the other movies that we watched while they're in Stryker's like facility or whatever, it's Mystique, Hank, Quicksilver, Nightcrawler, and Gene Scott. Um, and someone else goes to help them to break them out. Gene and them stumble upon Stryker's latest experiment, which was Wolverine. And what we last saw of Wolverine doesn't match up with how he gets here. So I don't really know how he gets up in this situation, but he's still within Stryker's hold, even though the Stryker we saw that picked him up in the last movie was fucking Mystique. We can just skip to the battle of this movie because everything else is kind of like unimportant. The less powerful horsemen are up against Hanks, Scott, Jean Grey, and Mystique is going up to Eric to try to break him out of his metal element ball that he created. In the scene of Apocalypse getting his like consciousness transferred into Charles's body, uh, this is where we finally see where Charles gets bald. And it, again, is what it is, but it gets him bald sooner, but like, <laughs> That's the reason why he's bald? I mean, I guess, I don't know. Like he, I guess that's why he's bald, but like, how does he get bald in the, uh, in the other timeline? He's just bald because of his genetics. And in this one, he is bald because some super bad villain was trying to take over his body. Awesome. That makes completely sense. Apocalypse wakes up and realizes he's still in his ugly body. Me too, queen. Me too. I, I know the shock. I know the feeling. It's okay. And Apocalypse is like, oh, all pissed because Charles escapes because Kurt gets him. So Charles's diva transformation is complete and Apocalypse hasn't even begun his. So it's very like dramatic. Mystique leaves Eric alone. And in these moments, he has like a full romantic flashback of his moments with Charles, AKA there's so much more to you than you know. There's good too, I feel it. Like that's his all time bae. Like he had a whole romantic edit in the middle of the end of the world. That's how strong their relationship is. He had a full blown romantic edit in his brain. As the end of the world is about to approach. Awesome. Apocalypse goes off President Snow on Charles saying that he knows Charles is out there. We're still connected, you and I. Show yourself, Charles! 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 Have 
Rescue your weaklings! And as Apocalypse is approaching Charles, because he's just like in a building, <laughs> he's just like in a building with like Gene, Scott, like they're all in there, like Moira. Moira's somehow there. I don't know why she's there. I don't know why she got to join another mission after she's the reason why Charles is paralyzed, but whatever. That's a hot take. Like Apocalypse is like, give yourself up for your family. Give yourself up so they can live your life for theirs. And Charles is like, I'm gonna go. And then they're like, no, you can't. Because like Charles is, if he is you, he has literally all of us. Like there's no way you can do that. And so he's at like a loss for words. So instead of giving up, they give Charles a pretty quick but cool scene. I will say I do like this scene where he's like, we're still connected. And then he goes, he lays back down, bald head and all. Thank you for letting me in. Thank you for letting me in. And then he goes into Apocalypse's mind and gives him the beat down for a good two minutes. And although like he loses eventually, like Apocalypse says get him, Charles gave him a good beat down for a good while. I thought you had four horsemen looking like you have no horsemen. L, L, Apocalypse, L. But Apocalypse really doesn't need all those other people. He kind of just like needs himself because he's that powerful. Like if the comics goes as true, he doesn't really need any help. And he doesn't. Apocalypse is fighting like three physical battles while beating the fuck out of Charles in their minds. He tosses Hank to knock him out. Scott gets embedded into the wall and Moira is just like standing there. I still don't know why she comes to these things. The professor asks Jean for help. And once she enters their mind, he tells her to let her powers go with no fear. Let go, Jean! Jean, let go! Jean, let go! <laughs> and she simply, like, walks up to the stand, levitating, and demolishes Apocalypse. Phoenix released. We finally see that Phoenix disintegration that we loved from the last stand. Magneto stabs him with a bunch of metal. Scott starts lasering him. And just as he's about to portal himself away, Storm lights that portal up and he is gone into thin air. Took that many people to kill him, but we needed the mind strength of Gene as well. And they win and that's kind of the end all be all of this. They rebuild the school, everyone's happy and it just seems too good. The only person that died in this movie, which I think is like really pointless is Angel. I think Angel's the only character that dies. Like think about Last Stand, like Last Stand was like a pretty big threat at play and like they were dropping like flies, like Charles dead, Scott dead. Magneto lost his powers, Gene dead. Like, it was like no mercy. And in this movie, supposedly the baddest, biggest villain of the entire X-Men universe, like some might say, fucking nobody died. I'm like, I'm not saying I want these characters to die, but it just seemed a little too easy. Nobody, everybody survived that. It was that easy. You couldn't even kill off Moira. You know, sure, I can't convince you to stay. Psychic, Charles. You can convince me to do anything. Goodbye, old friend. Good luck, Professor. I guess I have to move on to the next movie. I'm gonna try to talk about Dark Phoenix as fast as possible because I don't really want to spend that much time talking about it. This is the true epic failure of the entire X-Men franchise, excluding the New Mutants because I can't even begin to accept that that movie is a part of My Dear X-Men. I know a lot of people were saying like New Mutants wasn't that bad. I think you're all lying to yourself because it was actually filled horribly. I don't I didn't like it at all. And I stand by that. We start out with the same one dimensional characters that we left off with in Apocalypse. So you have the same characters, Kurt, Jean, Scott, Quicksilver, Raven's still there and she's still just lackluster. She's not Mystique and it's really, it's honestly very boring. A similar story to Last Stand. This is, you know, Jean's story arc. This is Dark Phoenix, which is based off the comics Dark Phoenix. And it, you know, it's about her storyline. It's about Charles finding her. You know, they have like a Dumbledore meets Tom Riddle type scene where Charles comforts Jean after the traumatic accident. You think you can fix me too? No, you are not broken. 
he ends up wiping her memory so she doesn't really know the extent of what happens and he takes her in and it's really sweet but he's actually doing some evil things behind the scenes. It's 1992 there's a space shuttle launch issue and the president of the United States uses his X-phone to call up Charles and ask the X-men for help to save the humans that are about to blow up in the space shuttle. This starts off a whole like big argument between Raven and Charles because basically what happens on the mission is that they cannot succeed but Charles is like no bitch like you have to save that last human like you have to save them like stay up there Jean can do it like Jean can do that and Jean gets so close to the blast and ends up like absorbing half the blast then Raven yells at him and is like uh you basically risk our all of our lives up there like I don't know why you would do that and I think Raven makes a lot of points within this scene like I think she's like you just want the glory and I can't talk about Dark Phoenix without out talking about the iconic line from the iconic character Mystique. She says, and by the way, it's always the women around here saving the men. Terry, you might want to think about changing the name to ex-women. And I don't want to sound like some stinky misogynistic man right now. Like I don't want to sound like that because I'm not, like I love, I'm sorry, I love a girl power moment in movies and I know a lot of people don't like them. I think they're fun. I think they're fun and fresh. I hated this line more than anything in the world because not only is it a crazy thing to say being as Charles did not come up with the name X-Men and X-Men doesn't even derive from really anything that he creates. It comes from G-Men whenever they were working for the CIA. Raven also brings this up later in the film when she's talking to Hank and she's like, there's a reason why there's an X in the name. And it's like alluding that it's like for X, like Xavier like that's the reason why they're called X-Men when really it's like not at all about that like it's what do you think the X and X-Men stands for I would assume and I think this is correct that it's based off of the mutant X gene and it also makes no sense for Mystique to say this in my opinion if it was any other character I might have understood this but it's weird to put that constraint on Mystique. Mystique does face the you know pressures of being a woman right like she's not immune to that but for Mystique in terms of actual living within society and like the, the, the struggles she faces she knows no gender she's Mystique she can be anything she wants she does not have to conform to anything because she is Mystique. Gender means nothing to her. She can be anything. There are no boundaries for her. And I know people might disagree with this and you might, if you read the comics or watch the cartoons, you might be like, no, like Mystique is very like all about, you know, being a woman and stuff like that. And she makes a lot of points within the comics, but I don't think she does. And it really doesn't make sense for a character with her mutation to emphasize that and really be so caught up around the name. I think like whoever wrote this movie had no idea who Mystique was and just like went off the walls with her and just wrote a very bland one-dimensional character and practically ruined everything that we know about Mystique within the movies. Like not only is this like a character assassination of Mystique, she also dies in the movie. Uh, Jean kills her. Jennifer, if you just didn't want to do any more movies, you could have just said that. The main villain of this movie is Jean, of course, and the alien species played by Jessica Chastain. Jessica Chastain has made a comment about this movie and working on this movie and how she didn't know her character's name until she watched the movie because they don't say her character's name throughout the entire movie. She is just this vague alien species that wants to take over and inhabit this planet. Cool. Cool, that's so awesome. I don't know, I don't understand the villain of this movie because it's this alien species that comes down and I don't know why they need Jean's help. I don't know why they need Jean's power because they killed people and multiplied like it was nothing. Like they literally like twisted their gut and like killed them like in two seconds and possessed their body. Like it, they don't need help. I don't know why they need help. I don't know why they need her power. They did it so easily already. I wrote like a bunch of notes down for this movie, but I literally cannot go through it again. Like I'm, I'm reading all this and I really, I really can't 
talk about it like I, there's nothing to say it's like all goo it's all nothingness like jessica chastain wants gene's powers she's like what you absorbed was like an energy force it's a spark like i can show you like if you don't want it i'll take it like a d i don't know i i actually don't know and i and honestly i don't care i don't care we have like eric's gang versus charles's gang like meet up eric like comes up to kill Jean and Charles is like, no, like, don't do that. Like, she's gonna be mad. And then he's like, you're always sorry, Charles. You're always sorry, Charles. And there's always a speech. And there's always a speech. But nobody cares anymore. But nobody cares anymore. Magneto gets alone with Jean and tries to kill her. And she kind of like eats with the scene. She goes, you kick me out and now you've come to kill me? And you couldn't even do that. Let me show you how. Let me show you how. She sort of she sort of slayed with that one. Like I can't even deny the slayage of that one because like Magneto got humbled because she like squishes his helmet and like throws him through the building. Like I thought that was really cool. I think a lot of the visual effects within this movie are very cool. I think they look really visually pleasing. And I think some of Jean's lines are good, but I don't think her character is where it's supposed to be. Like I think Jean Grey within The Last Stand is better, a better portrayal of Jean than this movie which is weird when you have an entire movie dedicated to her. Now Charles finally gets to her like it's ever worked in the past and she's all mad at him. Jean is all mad at Charles and then Jessica Chastain randomly is like, she's not your little girl anymore. And Charles is like, and who the hell are you? Who the fuck are you? Like, who are you? Who are you? And why are you talking to me? Like, I have no idea who you are. And I do want to say that one of the nastiest scenes I've ever seen, like, Jean is the definition of nasty in this scene because she tells Professor X to walk to her and then proceeds to make this, make him paralyzed from the waist down. She proceeds to, like, puppeteer him up the stairs using her powers. I, that's gotta be one of the, like, god awful scenes i've ever seen like that's nasty gene like i can't even defend you on that that's actually so that's so gross there's an entire big fight scene on a train the mutants come together and fight the aliens there's a pretty cool scene in this uh like fight where magneto like triggers all the guns to shoot at jessica chastain and she's like literally like like does is not even phased by it and i do think that's like a pretty cool shot of jessica chastain but cool shots can't save you from everything because they end up doing this whole fight on the train or whatever they end up in this like field jean's fighting jessica chastain jessica chastain is like if you kill me you kill them all basically like the power that it's going to take to kill me will kill all the ones you love so jean takes her and Jess up to space and explodes in the air, saving, saving everyone. My emotions make me strong. And then it cuts to everybody else and they're all sad. But it has the audacity to cut to Eric as if he was the first one that wanted her dead. It's like, don't piss me off. And then Charles says, She's free. She's free. She's free. And then the school is renamed Jean Grey's School for Gifted Youngsters, which doesn't make sense because she didn't really learn anything from that school. She only learned that there was stuff being hidden from her. It's a bad movie. It's all around a bad movie. Entertaining, visually pleasing at some points. I think some of the visual effects on this movie are like superb and I think they're really cool to watch. But overall, for every single character involved, it's like a complete character assassination. It's like Magneto's off the walls doing shit. Like he's kind of doing shit that he would already do. Like he, 
But the, he's not because Magneto that I, I think when we would know and we've seen would want to use Jean to kill all the humans. Like, right? Like, that's what we know him from The Last Stand, but you can't redo that. And that's what I think, like, the major flaw within choosing to go to Jean Grey's story is that it's, like, way too close. So you're, like, repeating history. And they repeat all, basically all the same mistakes. Like... Every single mistake they make is just redone. You don't even have that integral, like, point of Jean Grey truly turning. Like, she doesn't end up killing anyone other than Raven, who is like, but it's like not even as impactful as when Jean kills Scott. Like, when Jean kills Scott, you know there's no point of return for her. But in this movie, it's like, Jean Grey goes so far and then also has a change of heart and is able to save everyone. And it's like, I just feel like they are ill-equipped to write Jean Grey stories. They make so many similar mistakes, like draw out time, try to pack too much within one movie, involve this weird alien species that doesn't really make any sense, that is threatening but really pointless to me like has no motive other than to do a simple like earth takedown and has nothing to do with mutants has nothing to do with anything that we care about in the x-men universe x-men universe is all about the mutant versus human war and where those actions lead them to and in this movie it's like okay aliens just want to wipe everyone out awesome cool like I care like I give a fuck actually like I don't care I just am very disappointed by this movie and it really sucks because it's like you have the cast that you all love you have Michael Fassbender James McAvoy you have Jennifer Lawrence but then it's like Jennifer Lawrence doesn't want to get blue like she doesn't want to sit in the makeup chair so we can't have that she doesn't want to be a part of it anymore she doesn't want to play these kinds of characters anymore she doesn't want to be a part of franchises anymore okay we'll kill her off. You have Sophie Turner and give her nothing basically. You, we know that she's able to act. She's proven that time and time again and you give her like shit to work with. So it's like you have this like pretty good cast to do this film and everyone just kind of has to work with shit. I hope you guys like this video. I know it was probably really long. I tried to keep it as you know concise as I could. I wanted to talk about all these movies with you guys. I was really excited to talk to you guys about these movies, especially the ones that are, you know, a mess. I was very excited to talk to you guys. Uh, I know you guys didn't like the last video of the X-Men movies, but I hope you guys liked this video. Uh, if you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Let me know your thoughts on these movies in the comment section down below. I would love to know what you guys think of X-Men movies, especially these ones, because I have a special place in my heart for them. And I will see you guys in my next video.